The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hi, I'm David, and welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down toys, tools, and appliances just to find out what's inside. I think this doesn't need any further introduction, but just in case, this is the 2002 iMac G4. Isn't it pretty? <laughs> This is the first time I've actually been face to face with an iMac G4, uh, even though I've always admired how pretty they are, they are a good looking bit of kit. And for the time, uh, LCD screens were just sort of coming in uh, and to have one built in was kind of cool. And I hadn't really realized this was a thing that if you move the screen up and down, it always stays parallel. It's a really nice touch. I mean, you can still alter the pitch, but whatever pitch you put that at, stays parallel. Nice touch. I don't know why, but for some reason I was a little bit disappointed with the screen makeup. Um, this bezel, this plastic bezel, actually sits around the screen. And I don't know what gave me this impression, but I always kind of pictured that actually that was a complete piece of glass that went over the screen or was actually integral to the screen. Uh, we certainly dealt with some screens around this time uh, in a school environment uh, to protect pe these screens from people throwing mouse balls around when they got bored, which of course were breaking the screens. But these, th we've managed to find some that had like a tempered piece of glass over the front to, to protect it. But uh, yeah, I, I feel like that could have been done and it would have been a really nice touch, but otherwise this is just a plastic sheet that's kind of stuck around the edges. It's still cool though, it's still cool. So I have actually found the service manual for this and I do know that there should be a special piece of equipment that you sort of rest this on when you're dismantling it. I obviously don't have that, but I'm gonna do my best to make sure the screen doesn't get damaged. I'm sure it'll be fine. We'll see what happens. First thing I'm gonna comment on is the quality of the base, considering this is what it stands on and you're supposed to never see it. This thing's gorgeous. I'm not really, uh, I'm not sure if this serves any practical purpose. The only thing I can think it does is uh, stops the bottom taking a whack and getting dented. So Wi-Fi on this was an option that you could have fitted at the factory, uh, or you could add it as an optional extra. This is definitely an Apple product, but the form factor this way looks like a, uh, a PC card or a PCMCIA card, I think they were, which the big slots you used to have on laptops for putting accessories in, but I don't recognize that pin connector along the edge. I think that must be a bespoke Apple card. Obviously it's all Apple branded, but it'd be interesting to know what actual Wi-Fi chip is on board that because that is undoubtedly gonna be a, an off the shelf part. And over here we have the optional memory upgrade. Now again, this is quite interesting because this is a standard RAM module, but this is an SODIM chip, so this is essentially laptop memory. Uh, for anyone that's interested, this is a 256 meg expansion, which adds to the onboard memory, so that was always an upgrade slot. But that's kind of an interesting thing, and I want to come back to that in a little while. I should have said, and I didn't before I started, uh, this actually doesn't work. Um, when you plug it in and turn it on, you just get a constant series of beeps. Now I tried looking up online to find out what that error code was. Couldn't actually find any results. So I'm none the wiser as to what's wrong. Hopefully, if we go through this in enough detail, we'll actually spot what the issue might be and maybe even fix it. I'm not gonna hold my breath though. So this is the logic board or essentially the computer and straight away here is full size DIMM or dual inline memory. Now I can't think of another device where DIMM and SO DIMM are used simultaneously because it's not like one's a graphics memory upgrade, this is system memory but it's combining DIMM and SO DIMM and I find that unusual. Also in here you can see we've got the system battery. I wonder if that's good. 
because if this battery's failed, that's entirely possible. That's a reason why it might not want to boot. Okay, so this little daughter board has got a nice little riser pin, but it's also got this little daughter board connector, which runs to this little daughter board, which is the uh, mobile, the phone line connection. That's the RJ11 for the phone line connection. So this must be a dial-up modem, which makes sense because it's got, yeah, big segregation between the two circuit sides. So you've got, I can see that this side of the PCB is very unpopulated. It's got no ground plane in the PCB at all. So this will be all your phone line side. So this will be up to 50 volts in the UK or higher, I think actually. Right, motherboard is now separate. Now, what I will say for this machine is obviously versus the iMac G3, uh, which was from 1998. So we're only talking a four year difference. The heat dissipation has become much more of an issue. See on here, we've got the GeForce FX, which with your graphics, on the top side, I'm guessing you've got some integration chips, maybe uh, a Northbridge type affair, memory controllers, things like the peripheral controllers, things like that. Under here, I'm guessing you've got the um, PowerPC chip. Yes, this is still PowerPC, despite me saying this in the iMac G3 video. But this is one of the last generations of PowerPCs. But it's really interesting to me that uh, the screws, these big screws, which went all the way from the bottom, all the way through, these heat sinks in the corner uh, to help transmit the heat up to the top half of the case. So this part of the case is all, oh, I'm assuming die cast alley, it could be any material within reason. That's a lot of heat dissipation and this heat pipe arrangement is something we didn't even see a hint of with the G3. So the PowerPC architecture between 1998 and 2002 obviously got a lot more power hungry. Now, from what I understand, that was one of the key reasons for Mac moving from PowerPC architecture to the Intel architecture, because it was about this time Intel moved from the Pentium 4 and the Pentium D and the Pentium H, which were all netburst architecture, over to the core architecture which was the start of the core two duo processors. Obviously, don't believe everything you read on the internet, but I seem to remember there's a quote from Steve Jobs saying that they moved back to Intel because they had superior TDP, thermal design power, or um, watts per clock in terms of processing power. That was one of the key decisions of why they moved away from the PowerPC architecture to Intel. So this base is nothing any more than a power connector and the coax lead for the Wi-Fi. Uh, but this is called a uh, conductor 80 cable. It's actually got a core in between every used core. I don't know if that made much sense, but basically there's twice as many conductors on this ribbon cable as there are actually there are pins. And basically the ones in between the ones you use are there for screening because it was sending data down this line so fast, you were starting to get issues and it couldn't keep up. So they solved that partially with a conductor 80 cable. Now I'm not gonna complain, but the screws they used to hold everything in on this thing are really long. I don't know if they had issues with uh, the, the aluminium case stripping its threads or anything, but just monumental. And here we have a very, very dusty hard drive. Nice. Uh, and a ribbon, which is branded Foxconn. Surprises me, so this dated from 2002-ish. Uh, Foxconn actually were one of the principal manufacturers of the iPhone when that came out in 2007. So obviously Apple and Foxconn have got a very long lasting relationship. So the DVD drive, I find it weird that the CD drive only has screws on one side. I'm not sure that would have been an original feature or whether that's actually somebody's done a repair on this and not put all the screws back because there are definitely marks on here so someone has been in here before and not put all the screws back i say that like when i put it back together all the screws are going to be there uh, so yeah this is just a sony cd dvd rewrite drive sorry I should clarify cd rewrite and dvd drive apple branded which is weird because i bet this is based on exactly the same as one of their others it's even got the pressing in the metal now that little notch there there and on the bottom side would have been where the bezel would have clipped in the front. I don't really understand the need for this sticker. <laughs> I would guess this is purely decorative because this sits just under the fan in the unit 
and I wonder if they wanted when you looked through the hard drive, looked through the fan grill on top, not to see the metal, you just wanted to see white instead. Surely it can't be that cosmetic. There's your hard drive. It is a normal 80 gig Hitachi hard drive. There's nothing special about that at all. Now, based on the wires going between this part over here, and of course the main power connector to the board, along with the Molex connectors for the drives, I have a sneaky suspicion I know what's gonna be here. Yeah, there you go. So that's your connection to your mains input on the bottom of the board over here. So this is all gonna be a rectification. Actually got a plug on it. I don't know why I hadn't expected that to be a plug. I thought that'd be a permanently soldered wire. There you go, there's your first half of the power supply. So let's have a look what the other half looks like. It's nice that a lot of the internal screws are actually the same type. So hopefully it won't matter too much when I'm putting it back together if I put them in the wrong place. Ah, no, here we go. Here's some different ones. So a bit of RF shielding and the second half of the power supply. Still not seen anything I would obviously attribute to why this doesn't want to boot. Oh, that's kind of cool. So I'd never really given any real thought to how they got the cables into the stand. Um, because of course you could see the, the air grill where there were never any wires. So these little spokes which go from the outside to the center in little white pipes carry all the cables. Now, again, it's quite interesting to me that there's one spare. Was there an option for another feature on the monitor? As far as I know, there was a webcam which came with this model. It was a USB one which you just ran up the outside. And there you go, there's your loom assembly. Oh, interesting. So yeah, there you go. It's a nice big Apple branded lampshade, maybe? But yeah, there's, there's a fair old amount of weight in that. That's definitely where the weight is coming from anyway. Now, I suppose that's the other interesting thing. Is this actually going to be an otherwise off the shelf monitor? I mean, is this a screen made by one of their third party manufacturers? This feels so violent and unnecessary. <laughs> so I can see down the back here a good number of plugs, which hopefully I can get out without totally demolishing everything. Unfortunately, the signal cables are not on plugs, which is a real shame. So that means I don't think I can take the whole thing apart. An LCD panel with high frequency for the backlight. Uh, I think that was an LED. Still not sure what this connection is though. Oh, microphone. So there's a microphone in the bezel for the screen. Okay, so that's the microphone. That's the LED. Power and control for the backlight. Similarly here, because it spreads the backlight around the edges. Fair enough. And then this is your display driver. Oh, look at that. There we go. Now, as far as I can tell, this LCD assembly is standard. There's nothing special about it. The only thing slightly special is this die-cast aluminium around the edge, which clips into this frame, which is a lovely frame, actually. Um, I think if you were doing something like taking a 17-inch laptop screen and modding it, you'd probably have some good joy getting that in. If you were really clever about it, I think you'd actually probably be able to make that bezel slightly smaller as well. I mean, there's still a good 20, 25 mil here of white bezel. Now, I like this clear Perspex edge. I think it's very aesthetic, but if you made that smaller, you could probably get an 18 inch 1080p screen in there. A nice LED backed one. It's totally feasible to either reuse or replace these cables running up the arm. Great for a modding project, I think. Challenging, yes, but 
doable. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to see what hardware you could now fit in there. If you were using a two and a half inch SSD drive or even a, uh, something like a, an Intel NUC or a Mac Mini, there's loads of scope of what you could do in here. Just uh, alter the packs, uh, uh, the um, cable entries on the back, uh, which would be quite easy to do. Yeah, I think this is, this is a great opportunity for some really interesting mods. Now, electronically, I'm still fascinated by the heat dissipation uh, and the arrangement of the heat pipes that the PowerPC afforded them back in 2002. Knowing how heat thirsty the, uh, the equivalent Intel chips were, I think this is fascinating. And it always amazes me to see how something that you can conceptually conceive as a completely bespoke product from top to bottom is actually a very clever assembly of standard off-the-shelf parts. And it's interesting that through Mac history, the closer to modern times and that switch to Intel, the more standardized their parts become. There was obviously uh, savings and economies of scale to be used that paid off. And you start to see that standard memory, albeit I still find it weird as a combination. 56K modem, custom. Airport, starting to look like custom parts. Standard hard drive, standard CD drive. Special power supply, special motherboard. Probably a, uh, a standard screen module. It's just a great technique of building to make things look, look special. I guess that's what we as engineers and electronics engineers do. We take all those standard off the shelf parts. We take a transistor, we take uh, an audio amplifier and we put it together in a circuit that nobody's ever made before. If it was available as a standard package, the job would be done. So that creativity and how you put the things together is what really fascinates me about these things. And I hope you really enjoy watching these too. Uh, I certainly enjoy tearing them down. I hope you enjoy finding out with me what is inside. Uh, if you've got a suggestion for anything you'd like to see, head over to the Element 14 community and let me know. You can find me at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.